Welcome to the Hustle or Bust podcast powered by Paver Art. Our mission is simple, to dive deep into the world of entrepreneurship, small business, and all the success, struggle, and challenges that need to be confronted in the pursuit of growth. We celebrate the entrepreneurial spirit, but perhaps most important, we want you to learn at least one idea that you can put into action immediately to make your investment in time worthwhile. Welcome to episode 25 of the Hustle or Bust podcast. On this episode, we talk about an often overlooked trait in business, humility, being open to criticism, fresh ideas, and deficiencies in your business. In other words, being coachable. We hope you find a nugget or two and drop us a line with some feedback. We were talking about Donald Trump. We were talking about Elon Musk, and it morphed into a discussion about business owners and humility, which I think is a really interesting topic. Now, I'll speak for myself. I I love to talk. I'm sorry, I just love to talk. (laughs) (laughs) I love to listen, but I love to talk. And I know that sometimes I can come off as maybe not being so humble. But I am. I I truly appreciate where I've come from, uh, the people that have been a big influence in my life. I, you know, I love all of them, and I truly appreciate everything that's been done for me, okay? And that in and of itself should make you humble because when you look at that and you're able to look at that and say, and honestly say, I wouldn't be here if not for all of those people that contributed whatever it was that they contributed to my life, that's being humble. Uh, You know, nobody's so special that they're better than somebody else. That's That's kind of the way I was raised. My dad was like that. It's very humble. My brothers, we can talk a little bit about him, very humble. Uh, you know, everybody that I know, every, you know, the, uh, my small clash of, clash of, of friends, uh, both male and female, they're all very, very, they're, they're very humble people. My wife is humble, okay? Um, I may be a little boisterous and, you know, a little profundo from, from time to time. But that's that's you know that that doesn't mean that I'm not that I'm not humble and I don't know where I came from. So I, it, it's a topic that I think needs to be talked about, and uh, I'm interested in what you think. I think what what started us talking about it was um, I've probably said it on a number of podcasts. You might have too. I'm a massive Elon Musk fan, right? As am I. So in the world of small business owner. I gave an assessment. I think Elon is, if you were to make a list of the top five entrepreneurs Mm -hmm. of all time, hard to make an argument that Elon does not belong on that list. He belongs on that list, and he's up closer to the top versus number five, right? Mm -hmm. SpaceX, The Boring Company, Tesla. I mean, the guy's a world beater. Having said that, now, put your small business leadership hat on. The Boring Company. Yeah, the, you know, he digs tunnels to alleviate <laughs> traffic. Now, why does he Why does he want to alleviate? He calls it soul crushing. Nothing worse than sitting in four hours of traffic when he should be able to get there in 20 minutes. <laughs> soul so he decides to buy, build a tunnel. I mean, who does that, right? So the guy's amazing. Having said that, it is hard for me, being objective, to look at what he's done with the Twitter thing, the acquisition of mm-hmm. Twitter, basically putting forward an airtight contract that he's going to close, he's going to do it without due diligence, and then a look at the past five months of him pulling out in July and then Twitter taking him to court. And now we're in the Delaware Chancery Court and he's basically realizing he's going to lose and he's going to lose bad. Mm-hmm. To look at all the impacts, the legal fees, the distraction for Twitter employees, how much time is he pulling away from Tesla and SpaceX to go screw around with this acquisition? It got me thinking, does he not have a board of advisors, a group of friends that say that are basically saying, "Hey, boss, you're screwing this up." Mm-hmm. Number one, you're overpaying for it, and then you pulled out, and now you're going to go rewrite the offer 
for the same price that you originally did, how many billions of dollars of value have been evaporated because whether he's impulsive or he doesn't have friends around him telling him what he needs to hear, not what he wants to hear. And the text messages that, that have come out, he's surrounded by a bunch of yes men. Well, so was he not humble enough well, let's to, take, well, to take outside counsel? I will take, I will take the other side of that. Maybe he does have those people. Okay, maybe there are people that tell him. Maybe he's not listening. Elon, you, you need to take a few minutes and think about what you're doing here. Now, I'm not so. I'm not so self-important to think that I can, you know, that I know enough about the situation, the ins and outs of the situation, to pass judgment on, on why Elon's doing what he's doing. But what I can say is this: let's let's say he does have those people. If he's not listening to them, it takes humility to listen to them. Okay, uh, and it also takes a certain level maybe of maturity, maybe that's too strong a word, but some, there's a certain level of something where you you sit back and you look at yourself and you go, eh, they're right. That's humility. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we, th- neither one of us, <laughs> we're surrounded by people that will take us down. Oh, they'll, they'll knock us in the balls pretty that's quick. That's exactly right. And it's, Thank you know, God. Excuse me, Mike. You know, calm down. You know, Get a grip, okay? It's my wife, my best friend, several of my best friends, you, uh, the guys here, the guys here. <laughs> they're straight shooters. They'll be exactly right. And they'll bring you down choom, like that. Um, and they make you and keep you honest with yourself, okay? And that's all it is. It's, it's not that difficult. Well, you know, Jim Collins, uh, one of the... I think he's one of the best-selling business authors of all time. He wrote Good to Great, basically profile companies that were in the same industry, tracking along 30-year companies, Mm -hmm. and what distinguished the companies that broke out and became great. Stock market performance, I think, was his metric. Right. What distinguished those companies that became great versus the ones that kind of stayed steady state? The good companies, but they were not able to leap and become great companies. Sure. One of them was what he called level five leaders. These, when you think of leadership, you typically think of charismatic, outward, extroverted leaders. That's not what he found and what distinguished the great companies from the good. Right. The level five leaders, they had this overwhelming trait of being humble and being introverted, more retro, more introspective than this what, the, the prototypical charismatic leader, the cheerleader, so to speak, which is kind of interesting um, in terms of that being a commonality among the great companies versus the good. Well, here, here's let me let me challenge. Where where does a small business owner maybe have a deficiency? Right. Mm-hmm. I kind of opened up by saying I'm a massive Elon Musk fan, and then I said, I think he kind of screwed this up, and I think he's either not surrounded by a great board of advisors or right. friends, yes men, whatever it is. In the world of these, the, the top flight leaders, Elon Musk, Donald Trump, we, we had another person come in that said they they would love to interview Donald Trump and learn from his business acumen, mm-hmm. and they were in our business, they were in the, the trades, right? Well, and, and the first thing that came to my mind is, well, you wouldn't be thinking that if you were one of the 5,000 contractors that he stiffed in Atlantic City. Sure. Right? Exactly. Does that come into your calculus of great business expertise? Mm-hmm. Or or are you looking through the world with rose-colored glasses? So in the world of elite leaders, the highest of the high, publicly traded companies, senior political leaders, I think the world has a hard time of evaluating what success is. They're not objective in terms of that. So the question becomes, if you can't evaluate the human being at that level— when there's a lot of information, a lot of conflicting information, sure. How do you evaluate a manager within your business? Don't you? Are you able to? In other words, if you can just say, "I want to learn from their business expertise," but that doesn't even shape your opinion. The five thousand contractors, the Twitter failed deal, and the months of billions of dollars of value that's gone evaporated, legal expenses, distractions, all that. If you can't distinguish that in flaws in human beings, mm-hmm. what are you doing in your business? You follow me? Exactly. Can you shut it off like a light and be able to all of a sudden now have clarity of thought with your team that you're working with? I, I find it hard to believe that it's off and on like a light switch. Not that people are an analytical thing, but you've got to be able to... And the humility thing makes it easy. It just so happens that Elon and Trump, I don't think humility would be one of those things that we would describe on both of them, right? Agreed. 
I'm that well, absolutely. I'll give you an example. John, one of our employees, mm-hmm. he comes in the other day and we were talking about we're getting some forklift maintenance done and we've got a shop full of designs that we're trying to ship and John comes in and said, Hey, uh, just curious, th- those designs that you arranged for shipping, do they happen to be coming between one and three when the forklift's going to be down? Because if they are, then we're not going to be able to ship it. You and I didn't even think of it. Oh, thank God for John. John's two steps ahead of us, right? Yeah. Thinking about planning and problem solving, and he just does that naturally. He's very, very talented, very gifted. And I don't think we would call John an extrovert. He's an introvert. Mm-hmm. Thank God he is. He's thoughtful in a ways that you and I aren't. We're just moving through the day. Thank God John's thinking through. I mean, he's really talented, right? Now, how did I get on that versus the Elon and the, the Trump thing? Uh, but I think the evaluation... Now, these are leaders that are having these opinions where they're gung-ho. That's why I'm saying, look, I love Elon, right? And Elon can do no wrong. But in my mind, I, I like to think he can do no wrong up until the point when he does. And then you got to at least stop. That doesn't mean he doesn't, he doesn't make my top five entrepreneur list, but you've got to call a spade a spade and recognize what makes a great leader, what makes a great entrepreneur, or somebody on your staff. If you just gung ho on something, then you're gonna you're gonna have some massive blind spots in the world of people. There will be some people out there that will say, "Okay, Elon needs to be that way. He needed to be that way in order to be." successful mm-hmm. to, 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 what got him to, there. To, to climb that ladder step by step to get him through the really tough times and if you know the elon musk story there were tons absolutely of tough times tons of tough times that would kill a normal person but this guy persevered and he persevered through some very very trying things you know both personally and business-wise But to emerge from that with what he's got now and to be a genuinely humble person, wouldn't that be just so much better? Wouldn't refreshing. That, wouldn't that be, yes, ref- great word, but refreshing. If he but, came out and gave a press conference and said, let me do an honest self-assessment of the past six months mm-hmm. and here's what I screwed up, whatever it is. He has done that, by the way. He, he admits you know some of those very very serious mistakes in fact on one of the um uh, the all in conferences mm-hmm. he admits that to to the guys you know at the you know on the on the stage at the conference you know i made this mistake i made that mistake this one was extremely costly this one not so much but they were both mistakes serious enough that i had to take stock in who i am and what i do and I, I had to change my behavior as a result of that. Now, the, the, the Twitter situation is a whole nother, you know, pond of fish, I guess. I don't know. It's a, I don't know enough about it, but what we do know is this. I mean, come on. You've, it just, it just, why would you do what you did? Make the offer, back off the offer, decide to go back in. And now you're thinking about pulling it again. Well, here, this is you know, a win. It just, there's, this whole saga is a win for America. If you, our entire economic system, here's my view. Mm-hmm. If you write me a contract for 54, whatever it was, per share, no due diligence, waive all of this, and then three months later decide to back out for bullshit reasons, someone as smart as Elon all of a sudden thinks now there's a bot problem bigger than any thought. I mean, come on. It just doesn't bear. Now, you don't got to take my word for it. Yeah, He's now deep into the legal case. And there's like, another bumper sticker his, talking point. His, his yeah. lawyers are now saying you're going to lose and you're going to lose bad and you're going to get deposed. Mm-hmm. So when an Elon Musk goes under a five-hour deposition, nothing good's going to come after that. I mean, this, this guy's... He's too freaking important for our economic system to get deposed by lawyers in a legal case. His lawyers are telling him he's going to lose and he's going to lose bad. And we should all be cheering that. Because if someone can walk away from a contract, not make a, a vendor payment in the case of Trump, 5,000 of them, not go through with a deal. If we can't hold faith in contracts, our entire economic system collapses. Yes, we're down the toilet. So yeah. now he's going to buy it. And, and and by the way, Twitter's not taking his word for it. They're going to keep in a lawsuit until he buys it, right. which is good. We've got to have faith in contracts. Your word's got to mean something. Mm-hmm. And when you put that word in writing in a contract, they got to be able to hold up. This one's holding up. Um, that's a win for society. Whether Elon made a mistake or not, that's a different issue. You can't have contracts mean nothing and people just walking away from deals. We would collapse as a system. Would you say that stiffing somebody 
That's walking away from a contract. Walking away from Absolutely. a contract. Absolutely. But stiffing somebody like that is a telltale sign that there is no humility there. There's no integrity. There's no humility. There's no laundry list of stuff. If you walk, if you if you enter into a deal with me, I want you to, I've got the Taj Mahal and I need you to renovate the east wing of the bathrooms and that's a $2 million contract. Mm-hmm. And we put that in writing and I walk away from you. What does that say about me? Now, I could, I could, now, by the way, the bankruptcy laws allow people to do that. So when people go under, um, that's why in, you know, I learned this when I had to refinance one of my old companies, uh, take out the SBA and go to private lending. Mm-hmm. They called it the three C's. It was credit worthiness. Character was a big thing. And they talk about the banker. They And they, I'll never forget the guy. Uh, shout out to John Rath, chief lending officer for a major regional bank. He called money the, I'll never forget this. Money is the ultimate commodity. You know, I can give you $10 million, my bank can, this bank can, and they can lower the interest rate, you know, they can change the terms, the covenants, all that stuff, but money is the ultimate commodity. Sure. What the difference maker is and why we're going to lend to you and not you is character. And let's talk about character and who's standing behind the thing. And that's why this whole concept of personally guaranteeing debt matters because if the person's got character and they're willing to sign their name to it, that matters to a bank. Mm-hmm. And they'll give you millions of dollars, in some cases billions. So, but anyway, the uh, what your question was, do you think that says something about your humility? Yeah, it says something about your character, too, your integrity, all of those things. There's, look, the reason those two guys came up in the discussion is because they're the two most visible people that you, I mean, you can't turn you on can't, a television. You can't get away from them. Yeah, they're everywhere, and that's okay. I mean, just turn the TV off. You don't, you don't want to, you know, uh, get involved with that, uh, and that's fine, but the... Um, that's not to say that you should paint with a broad brush that all the CEOs, the CFOs, the CMOs, the C-suite folks, you know, the, uh, the VPs of whoever and whatever um, are in some ways, they're not all like that, okay? They're, they don't exhibit those traits. Uh, not all of them do. We know people, you know people personally, I know people personally that are not like that at all. And can buy and sell me ten times. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, they're just not like that. And you know, I think it truly has something to do with the the core of people that surround them. Those people that they trust the most. Those people that they're the best. They're that they're they're good friends with. I you know we we've talked about you know Angela gets a lot of pub on this podcast your buddy Angela. Oh, it was the first interview it was the first interview um it was the one that created a second podcast um he was the impetus for that uh there's there's a very humble guy that's very honest with you and he's honest with me too but he's not my best friend okay he's i like to consider him a friend now but he's your one of your best friends if not your best friend some of the things that he said, he's, you know, he he's being honest. That honesty comes from humility. It truly does come from humility. And he can be that way with you because he knows you. But the humility that he exhibits is very, very, I think, I, 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 that's, that's very important. You exhibit that. The two of you together, that's, you know, I'm really surprised the two of you did not ever get together and start a business. Mm-hmm. I mean, that would have been, I, I'd have loved to have seen that. Uh, but having said that, there's an example of a, of a guy that's just got 19 balls up in the air at one time, and he could be, you know what? I am king shit. End of story, you know. You're going to listen to what... That's not the way he plays the game. He's not that way. Uh, Another good example is my brother. My brother's... You know, I... I I, I don't want to embarrass him because people who are truly humble are embarrassed when other people talk about them. Mm -hmm. But I'm very proud of my brother. Um, And that is... That is manifested when you look at the number of people that want to be around him and want to be want to work for him it's the, the joke you know it, I've said this joke before 
you know, the joke in our family is at some point, look at all the people in this room, at some point, you're all going to be working for Ken Bull. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, you know, that would have been sort of funny 10 years ago. It's real funny now because it's true. Everybody in the room's working for my brother. You know, it's, but you'd never know that. He's, you know, he's just, he's just a very, very, very humble guy. And I just, uh, you know, when we get together, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful experience, but he's a good example of that. And the guys that we're talking about need to exhibit some of those traits. Well, I think if they exhibit those, some of those traits, you know, and they, they, I'm sure they don't care whether people like them or not, or maybe they do care whether people like them or not. And that's not that that's not the utmost thing. And you know, you got to live with yourself. You know, I if, if I was a, a boisterous, you know, uh, uh, constantly spouting off about you know how important I am. Oh my God, I I'd, I'd be chopped off at the knees every day. I wouldn't I I. I couldn't get. I wouldn't be able to get out of bed. Right. You know, uh, there's 20 people that would say, "Shut the hell up, Mike. Who the hell do you think you are? <laughs> give me, a, give us a break. You know, just come back, come back when you tone it down, and then you know you can be part of the. You can be part of the party. That's we've got. We're sur- you're surrounded by that too. Your wife would chop you off at the knees. Sure. My wife would just look at me in the eye and just, Mike, stop. Just stop it. You know. So. I think being a small business owner, by its very nature, is a humbling experience, right? Oh, it's every day. I mean, it's a grind. I mean, so you get faced with adversity, all this stuff. You can't be too full of yourself. Just by its very nature, it's going to work against you. It's a great point. From being arrogant. Yeah, that's, I think that's uh, a great point. The mar- nothing more humbling in the market and competing and trying to survive. For sure. So that's, that's a naturally... But I do think when you're looking at... The, the reason why, to me... The Trump, Elon, or any you know, fill in the blank, Obama. It doesn't matter. Political politics is always fraught with, but <coughs> any of these elite, well-known, universally known leaders. Why that's instructive for a small business owner is because, by its very nature, you've got an opinion: positive, negative, piece of crap, idle. You know that type of thing. Sure. It, it, there's so many blind spots in the face of contrary information. How can you have such an unobjective or a diluted or a distorted sense of what a true vision or true measure of success looks like if you've got that with the well-known publicly public figures? Mm-hmm. What do you have with your own people? So I think one of the hardest things when you look at that well-known leader and you've got an opinion is to process a real objective set of facts. If you can't do it with that, how do you do it with your own staff when you're trying to grow? Uh, it's- so again... Far right of the bell curve, 15 to 20 percent are able to grow. You don't think, and by the way, the most important part of any business is products important, it's the team and the people. Yeah, if the leader, the top owner, can objectively evaluate people, Elon Musk, Trump, whatever it is, Obama, any of these elite leaders, if they can't objectively say, but the facts are X, Y, and Z, and therefore maybe he's not a walk on water kind of guy or gal, if they can't do that with that level of leader. You don't think that turns over and bleeds over into their own staff? Oh. I think it does. Humility breeds respect. I, I think that's. I, I think that's pretty clear. You know, if if people know you to be sincerely humble as a person, and you're interested, you're humble enough to be interested in listening to what they have to say, and 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 know what their issues and problems are. Uh, and get involved with that sort of thing. If you're humble enough to do that, that breeds respect. And who doesn't want to be respected? I mean, I, I uh, one of the saddest things that can happen to somebody is, you know, you go through life and you realize that, you know, nobody really respects me very much. That's That's got to be a sad day when, mm-hmm. when somebody comes to that, uh, comes to that conclusion. There's, and there's a lot of our, there's a lot of folks out there that, are kind of in that boat. You know, I won't name names. We probably know who they are. We probably talked about a couple of them, but they just don't breed respect. And uh, you know, humility is one of those. You know, uh, one of those stool legs. You know, one of the many stool legs that you know uh, that that builds that uh, that that respect coefficient that 
you know, you you, you really want to have. Well, know, I think just, the what's the close sister, cousin, or whatever that expression is of humility? It's probably listening. Yeah, more than you're talking, right? True. Which is kind of ironic. We're doing a podcast, which we're talking, right? <laughs> but the the humble leader yeah, it gets it out of our system. It gets yeah, right, right. <laughs> so, but the humble leader is going to be looking for answers and asking questions more than they are spouting out their philosophy, mm-hmm. right? Exactly. Uh, so your staff is your your key to trying to figure out how to build a big business sure. or a, a successful business, whatever definition of success that you might have. But listening more than you're talking is definitely a a thing when it comes to humility and listening. They're one and the same, I think. We can go back to Jim McCluskey. Hmm? I believe that's the name. Fair Life Milk. Right. Okay. Um, and his the YouTube that he put out there immediately after uh, it was exposed. That, he laid it out there. Yeah. He, right. he just The animal welfare. Just opened it up, man, and just and just talked openly and didn't listen. There was people that said, "Look, you need to you need to get yourself aligned with a, a PR firm that will." Help you guide you through this very. There's crisis out there. That the crisis just, management. The issue. crisis management issue. The people that are involved with crisis management. They can. They can help get you through this. No. No. I trust people more than that. I. I trust people to understand. Good people will understand what I have to say to them. Okay. And I'm going to be very honest. I'm going to tell them what we're going to do. I'm going to tell them how we're going to do it. And I'm going to. I want them to see how sincerely sorry we are that. This happened on our watch. Beautiful. It's one of the best YouTube videos I have ever seen. Ever seen. And I, look, we just did an episode on branding. My wife said <laughs> yesterday, she said, listen, I'm going to the store. Is there anything else? That, is there anything that you need? Don't forget to get my Fairlife milk. I want the whole milk, you know. So you're a fan. Well, I became a fan because I had to find out what what was so special because it was a podcast that I listened to, and what was so special about this milk. And this man and his, and his wife have just just built this one. They built the biggest dairy farm in the world, you know, from what wasn't the biggest dairy farm in the world at one point. But you can't help but admire, and again, there's that word respect, the humble way that this guy went about the business of telling people we screwed up we're going to fix it here's how we're going to do it and if you didn't see sincerity and humility in what that man said you're just not looking close enough right. and i was I was very impressed with that now, i know i know we talked about this guy once before but that there was an example of i think true humility i, I think what you know another thing with business owners when you start to get growth going mm-hmm. there could be a time when you have to pick your own customers right you've got to say no to some customers so right i'll give you an example in, in our engraving world we do things a little differently we think it's better too there's a disadvantage though it's a little bit more time consuming mm-hmm. than what somebody that has a machine do their work like a laser engraving versus how we do it ours is more time consuming it just is right it's labor intensive it's labor intensive so and, and we get a lot of inquiries on that side of the business. Right. I'm talking to a client this week or a potential client, they're at, and I'm going through the whole thing on how we do it versus other people do it. Mm-hmm. We think our way is better, but their their way could be quicker and all that. So you've got to de- kind of decide what's most important to you. And they're, they keep asking about lead times so and how quick can you get it done, how quick can you get it done. And then they followed up with an email, asked again about lead time. So, I, so finally I said, you know what? We're not going to be a good fit for each other because I know if we go through this thing, and I'm longer than you want. You've asked me this question now four different ways, which is about speed in a handcrafted, labor-intensive way. I don't think we're going to be a good fit for each other. You're going to have to find someone else, right? So, and that, by the way, for someone that hustle or bust, we want to grow. That's hard to, hard to do. Hard to do. Hard to do. It's extremely difficult. But I've got to be. I don't know if that word is humble enough. Look, I'm not going to be able to. What went I'm not going to make mo- your. Ha- I'm not going to make you happy. And what? if my goal is to have five star reviews. And you're going to measure me by this one little criteria and not look at the big picture. Yeah. I'm just not going to be a great fit for you. What you you're mean, not going to be a great I fit for us, too. I guarantee you, because it goes through my head, too. During that phone call, while you're listening to that customer explain to you why you, he needs you right. to get this job done. And by the way, it was a church. This is funny. So the pastor wants this oh, thing. Oh, no. So, so the, you know, this is the pastor's right hand. They're, they're whatever they are. You know, they're doing a man. And I used to work in a rectory. My first job was at a rectory. I got paid $3 an hour. It was below minimum wage, but it was cash. 
Immaculate Heart. Shout out to Immaculate Heart of Mary for paying below, but it was cash. And but they didn't care about taxes because they're a tax free or not that I'm bitter on this or anything. But she's talking about the pastor, and they've got their 75th anniversary coming up, right? All right, so okay, uh, he wants them in the ground by December 31st. Okay, all right, I get it. Uh, uh, why December 31st? Is that because it's the end of the year? Yeah, it's the end of the year. All right, so if it was January 20th, oh no, December 31st. Oh, okay, I get it. It's the end of the year. That's different year than what January 20th would be or January 25th, but that's what the pastor wants. All right, so we're not going to be a good fit for the pastor. I can just tell right now, if he's that hard charging on a date and there's no event on December 31st, and so I'm going to have to do all kinds of things, and we talked about our things a little bit more labor-intensive. Either we got to get the pastor on the phone or we're just not going to be a good fit for you. So respectfully... Uh, we're going to have to have you find somebody else, right? So being able to say you don't need every customer in the world or every client in the world, there's a humility involved in that. You just If you think that you're going to have problems, be humble enough to say this is a big country. Let's go find someone that's a better fit. This is kind of like Dayton, right? Yeah. You, you've got to find the right fit here. As a small business owner, I can assure you your resources are not going to be infinite. If you can't pick your clients right and you're hearing on the other end time and time and time and and less importance on quality, quality, labor intensive and trying to find that mutual fit, you've got to be you got to be smart enough. Number one, pick your right clients. And we haven't done a great job of that in some instances, I can tell you. Yeah, I would agree. We're we're getting better at it. But some of these clients, churches in particular, they they are and they, they, by the way, they don't take coaching well. So I tell people, look, when things are when people are giving you donations, they want to see it in the ground. But I can assure you, if they're willing to donate 150 bucks to have their engraved brick, and if instead of telling them spring, tell them by fall of next year, they're not going to complain if you do it quicker. But they will haunt your ass if it's not in the ground by spring. Now, it might not be my fault. It's not, they got to get a contract. they got to do multiple things. Why would you tell them spring? Just tell them the fall. Yeah, it's a great point. But I, as you're telling the story... But they're not taking the coaching. They're so not, no. maybe I'm not doing a good job explaining it, but... <laughs> I can assure you, yeah, being humble enough to say no to customer and new revenue, even nice big projects, you've got to do that. Honesty, which is another... Maybe that's the thing. trade I'm talking about here. Well, but, well I was going to say, I, sometimes when you're honest with people, the initial reaction, especially on the phone, because they don't know you. Remember, right. they don't know you. Our job is to make sure that they get, by the end of that phone call, they're comfortable with who we are, Okay. Uh, it's more important that they be comfortable with who we are than mm-hmm. we be comfortable with who they are. They have to be comfortable with who we are. You know, we, we, we want that experience to be a pleasurable one. The fact that you were honest, there's a certain humility in that, but I know exactly what was going through your head because it goes through my head too. While they're talking... Are we taking I'm, on a headache? I'm thinking to myself, well, that's, that's one thing that's going through my head. The other thing that's going through my head is, okay, if I move this around and I take this out, and I hire 58 more people, and I do, I get this piece of, you know what, we might be able to get this job done. You go into problem-solving mode. You go into problem-solving. The problem is, by the time you're done, you already know the answer before you go through problem. This is what we do here every day. We know the answer to the problem. Right. Or not to the problem, to the, to the question. We know the answer to the question. That's why we go through all the stuff that we do every day. That's how we have meetings on this. We, you know, that's, that's why we list this. That's why we prioritize this. That's why we do Excel spreadsheets on that. We already knew the answer, but you're still going through. I might be able to, if I just tweak this a little bit. And just, by the end of the phone call, you're going, no. I, I just, when you, if you're honest with yourself... And you've got the humility to go back to that client and say, I just don't think we're going to be able to do this for you. And I, I sincerely apologize for that. And I'm sure there's somebody out there that can help you with this, but it doesn't look like it's going to be us. And, and what's point. interesting, in the world They'll of... They'll probably respect you more for that. We're talking more about client communications now, but why did the phone call happen to begin with? It could be advertising, it could be a Google search, right. or it could be that their previous supplier went out of business. And they tell you that right up front. They, sure. they used to do X, Y, and Z. But apparently they went out of business. Okay. Interesting little factoid. And you start going through the whole thing. And they wanted repairs done. Uh, interesting. Did, is that because they wore out or the paint wore out? Yeah. And did you want it for free or how did it work? <laughs> yeah, they said they would do it for free. Okay. And they went out of business. Right. Do you think they went out of business because they were making money hand over fist? 
I've never heard of a business that's killing it profitability wise, yeah. making money hand over business that goes at it. Do you think those two are related? That they sold you a product that wore out and you wanted them to redo it over for free and now they're out of business. At some point, the customer's got to take a step and I'm trying to educate them in a, in a soft sort of way. Right. Humble, I don't know if that's humble or not, but businesses don't go out of business because they're making money hand over fist. They go out of business for not covering their costs and doing work the second time and not charging for it. Yeah. Now, maybe they should have been upfront to begin with in terms of how long that thing would last. Should it be in the ground for 10 years and still look perfect on year 10? But they, they got to be transparent and honest enough. And now they go through the time thing all over again when their previous business went out of it, went out of business, their previous supplier. These things, being able to communicate to hard, that's a hard segment of customers. Mm-hmm. They want what they want. They've got donors. they got to satisfy the donors. I get all of that. I would too if I was in their shoes. But you've got to look at, the client's got to look at hard facts. When your supplier goes out of business and now you're on a search for another one and you still do it the same way, you're probably going to get the same exact result. Unless you have different information that you got to be able to process, and we can help them process through that. But we've had a number of those conversations. Absolutely, and you, you, you know, it's funny. You brought speaking of those conversations, you brought up something before that I thought was interesting, because we've talked about this subject from time to time too, and that's coaching. Okay, well, uh, there's there's no question that you, you've tried you try to do that with individuals, employees. Uh, clients that we might have, people that, you know, if, if you're looking at a business and you're kind enough to bring me in on the, to let me know what's going on, um, you know, I, I see you work with the client and gently coach them through the process. To take coaching, when Angelo sat on the other side of that desk where you are right now and you were sitting up there, to sit and hear what he had to say, that took humility. Mm-hmm. Kind of bring this back to the whole humble thing. To take that kind of coaching, not everybody's... The majority are not coachable, in my experience. Uh, well, and you've got the hard facts. You've got, <laughs> you've got the hard the facts. The majority are not coachable. Now, business owners get to a stage in life. Now, look, I, I, know, you, I know you pretty well now, and your, your coaching technique is very good. It's, it's... Oh, thank you, Mike. <laughs> well, thank you for that. I feel pretty good now. <laughs> Unless I'm coaching. And then all of a sudden, then, no, I'm just kidding. But there's, there's a... But, but no, seriously, I've, I've seen you do it. I've seen you in action. I'm, I'm in the room, okay? I'm on the, I'm on the conference call with you. And you have a soft approach. Um, you're not denigrating. You speak objectively but sympathetically. And I think that's a great way to coach. That's a great way to teach. And not everybody's just, because not everybody's, some people just automatically turn off the sympathy thing. They, not the sympathetic, the empathetic, not sympathy, empathy. Uh, they turn that off, okay? And they just realize the fact that this guy's trying to tell me how to run my freaking business. Well, yeah, that's kind of why you called us, okay? Or called you. Um, the humility that it takes to actually listen to someone who genuinely wants to help. You want to help, okay? You don't do this because you're a busybody. You do this because you want to help. There's a humility that's required there, okay? The humility to listen to, um, to Angelo that day and actually ask questions that were very pointed and not give up like a pit bull, you know, not give up by allowing us to give, you know, a bullshit answer, okay? Or an answer that just kind of, well, that's just the way we have to do things here. You know, he's not, he's not accepting that. There's humility that's involved in having to, having to be coached like that. So um, there's, there's, again, where, and by the way, we talked about this in a previous podcast where you need input from other people. You need that kind of, that input is just too important, um, you know. Uh, and the, the don't kick- feel that you're so self important. And oh yeah, I'm the one that's coming in here and working 12 hours a day, 13 hours a day, six days a week. I'm the one that's away from life. Yeah, we understand that, okay. But that's your choice. Right. It should also be your choice that if you want to get better, you need to listen to people that have 
an informed opinion that will help you. Yeah, the kitchen cabinet. Be humble advisors, enough to accept the help. Yeah, you you've got to have skilled help at your side, even if it's informal. Angela is one of those, right? So, but you know, there's lawyers, there's accountants. You sure. need paid or unpaid. You need people to give you a sounding board, an objective view. They got to get a little investment into learning your situation. But then you got to listen. You got to be coachable. If you're not coachable, I said it a million times. Don't put yourself through the enduring pain of sitting around and getting advice or whatever it is. Uh, just hope point. that you're right. I mean, it's you know, and in this economic time that we're going through, you know, the excrement's going to hit the coolant appliance or the shit hit the fan, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, you want to take coaching from your employees, although they're your employees. Ultimately, the owner's got to make the call and be accountable, right? towards running an enduring business exactly the outside advisors are meant to give you more strategic advice or a look in the mirror which is what angela did to us if we're not humble enough to take it and then make the list and start executing the things that we make sense then we wasted his time and we wasted our time so at the end of the day it's i think running on the heels of what you just said it's 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 yet another tool in your bag that will allow you to get better at what you do if you get better at what you do you're going to you're going to sell more of your products, and if you sell more of your products, you're going to get bigger. You're going to you're going to grow. You're going to be able to bring on more employees, employ more people. It's just. But by definition, this hustle or bust deal of being the growth company. If if you're at a hundred bucks today and you think your your future ten years down the road is to get to three hundred, right? By definition, you're not just going to magically grow there. There's got to be a series of changes in your business. And most of those are behavior changes among the people working into it. Mm -hmm. So if you're not open to what those changes can be, you're not humble enough to take that information, Mm -hmm. it's not going to magically happen. No. This this doesn't magically happen. you got to expedite it. It's the behavior change of what you're going to do differently, the one hour a day, two hours a day, five hours a week. What are those changes that you're going to do that changes your behavior, which by definition, you're going to stop doing other things. If you're working wide open right now, you've got to stop doing certain things and doing new things. Yeah. Got to be humble enough to admit what those things are. And it's all this spills out because we've talked about this on various. The themes repeat the themselves, don't they? They, they just they, it's they behavior. Absolutely do the word is change. The behavior change, the business change, investment change. That's going to get you to a new future that's uh, stronger than today. Yeah. It requires all of that. And change requires a, a certain amount of humility too. Right. So. It, by definition, if you're not humble enough to say that you can change a number of different things to get to a better state. Mm-hmm then you're not going to be in part that 15% of that bell curve that's able to grow. I think that sums it up very nicely. Um, I think we've hit it pretty good. What do you think, uh, Mr. Producer? Did we hit it? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Signing off from paperwork. Thanks, everybody. Please, if you've got any type of input, we'd love to hear your input. We'd love to get your feedback. And we'd also like a Google review if you get the opportunity to do so. But thanks for listening. Take care and have a good weekend. Thank you.